Hi there and um, welcome to the channel of a disappointed man with me Jason Kennedy the disappointed man and um, I've moved outside for this video onto my balcony so you can um, observe my uh, my avocado plant which I'm very proud of uh, sat behind me and the uh, the subject for today's talk will be uh, one of my favorite writers Denton Welsh and um, for those who know nothing about him, this will serve as, a, as an introduction. I hope you find it interesting. And those who have read his works, um, I'm going to recommend some other um, um, kind of Welsh-like um, writings that you, uh, you may not have checked out, that you could, you could also look at, because unfortunately Welsh left a, a, a rather uh, small body of work um, due to his uh, tragically short life, which we will come on to. So um, some biographical details. Uh, Welsh was born in 1915 in Shanghai and his father owned an interest in a rubber company. It's quite wealthy and his uh, mother was um, North American, um, a Christian scientist which does uh, leave a mark on the writings of Welsh and um, she died when he was just a boy which also had a, had a very powerful lasting effect on him. So his father sent him away to be schooled um, in England and he went, he attended Repton, um, the public school and um, the most famous old Reptonian is uh, probably Roald Dahl but whereas Repton celebrates Roald Dahl, Welsh's name has been scrubbed from the rolls because he said uh, many unkind things about Repton, uh, particularly in his, in his um, debut novel which we'll come on to. Now um, Welsh's uh, life ended when he was just 33 and uh, the reason for this was uh, the defining incident of his life which was also the subject for his final uh, novel which um, was a, um, an accident he had. He was knocked from his bicycle by a car while he was uh, riding, uh, pedalling away over a bank holiday weekend towards London and he was left with uh, terrible injuries and he was rendered a partial invalid um, for the rest of his days and um, his um, chronic um, condition caused lots of um, unpleasant uh, fevers and um, these gradually wore him down uh, and, and were responsible for his early death. Um, but the, the, the other um, um, lasting consequence of the accident was that he changed his course because up until that point he'd been a student at um, an art college in London and his uh, his dreams were of becoming an artist and he'd already um, enjoyed uh, some success um, but the um, the accident made the um, the physical rigors of painting impossible for him really so he did still paint but only in a kind of token way and instead he took his um, well-developed painter's eye and applied it to writing and that is um, that was um, a gift to us readers because it is wonderful writing and as I say particularly in the way it renders um, things in terms of their visual qualities uh, Welsh's really has few rivals for this as um, a few quotations uh, later will demonstrate. Now a little about his um, kind of makeup before we move on and that is he had some um, rather strange uh, interests which he pursued in uh, the most single-minded way and he's a very ambitious person too and um, also he was um, homosexual and um, in his books, he does engage in the kind of, um, what would we say, playing with his gender identity, I suppose it would be uh, called today. So there is some um, application of cosmetics and some cross-dressing and a general kind of interest in uh, sexuality from his uh, adolescence uh, permeates his uh, writings, I think, to, to uh, wonderful effect, um, you know, um, it, it is... It takes courage, writing at the time he did, to be um, so unrestrained. Although he was sometimes criticised for simply lapsing into uh, the scatological, which, which is true uh, upon occasion. And um, on that theme, um, 
it may be a very uh, rather strange connection to draw, but there are some um, similarities with the Carry On movies in his books um, in terms of the um, sort of the, uh, the the botched kind of sexual encounters and the general kind of horniness of the of the, of the world uh, of, of his writings, which may sound curious in the, uh, when it's sort of mixed with the uh, the innocent public schoolboy. Uh, appearance that he presents to the world. Okay, so Maiden Voyage, as the title indicates, is his debut, um, but also Maiden Voyage here has the double meaning. Uh, the effeminate Welsh is the maiden, right? And um, it has one of his wonderful illustrations on the front. There's just something so kind of like pre-Christian about these. You know, it's like these, this, uh, his, his illustration style that I really like and something so English about them. Um, so um, this is a very nice edition from Dutton, these 60s editions. So it begins with like a jailbreak almost, it's like breaking out of public school. So this, this is kind of amusing because it's probably the most unlikely picaresque hero one could imagine is, uh, is a 19, um, 19, what is it, 19, late 1920s early 1930s public schoolboy, <laughs> but he, uh, he must escape. So he uh, runs away from, uh, from school and is, uh, uh, basically runs out of money and just fetches up at, at the house of a family friend and sort of has to be taken back. He feels taken back in disgrace, but actually, of course, he's done what every boy in the school wishes they have the balls to do. And so he returns and is greeted as a, as a returning hero uh, by the boys. And it also prompts his father to take seriously his discontent and um, he sends this letter invi inviting him to come and spend the summer in Sh um, in Shankong, in China. Um, okay, so um, to, um, so that forms the action of the of the novel is the um, the trip to China and as I say it has this kind of picaresque carry-on quality because um, every possible way that um, a young boy could accidentally stumble into the company of half naked or fully naked young men is manufactured or contrived in this in this narrative so that, that does lend it its uh, real real kind of humor uh, there's some there's some peeping tom aspects. There's some, like I said, there's some cross dressing. There's some um, communal naked bathing that that goes on some bathing uh, in this case. Um, but if you if you read this one, it's uh, it's most amusing. But as uh, as my as my comments may be suggesting, there isn't much of a kind of plot. And this is one of the things Welsh is usually criticised for is there isn't really um, a strong story and um, a little like other writers perhaps like um, maybe like Catherine Mansfield this kind of right it's it's the observing of the world uh, rather than being able to always kind of directly participate um, so everything is um, is dis observed rather than sort of entered into whenever something threatens to become a little too intimate the, uh, the narrator will be making his excuses uh, and trying to uh, escape. Okay, so this one is a, a very enjoyable read. It's not his uh, finest work, but the um, the sections in China are really interesting. And, and being out here in, in Southeast Asia myself, um, the fact that one of my uh, literary heroes uh, uh, visited and wrote about this part of the world was a was a real thrill when I got to the Chinese section and um, Welsh's um, kind of aesthetic which enjoys encountering like novel sensory experiences and recording them very precisely it's a great sort of training ground for his literary art are all these unfamiliar sights um, and sounds and, and um, of China. So this one is uh, is a good one, it may be for the Welsh completist. I should notice if um, if you do enjoy this one or you've already read it, it's patterned on J.R. Ackley's Hindu Holiday, which uh, is from uh, the, uh, the 20s. And um, Ackley was a, was a 
friend, close friend of Ian Forster. And Ian Forster, as um, you may know, uh, was out there in India. And he recommended Akali go out there and be a secretary to this very eccentric Maharaja, and um, who was a pederast. And Akali was also, like Forster, uh, homosexual. And so they did hit it off. But the, uh, the Maharaja is the, is the central character here. It's an, an amazing uh, um, character study of him. And he's a little like Toad in Wind of the Willows. He's always got these uh, uh, crazy enthusiasms. And he, he takes uh, Western culture incredibly seriously. Everything's taken in the most literal way. And he worships the, uh, the ancient Greeks for their boy love. And he's trying to construct uh, some uh, sort of mock Greek, uh, mock Greek temples uh, in his territory. And uh, Welsh read this and he was kind of impressed by the fact that it, of what it lacked. He didn't need necessarily a strong plot to produce a very entertaining travelogue. So if you have read Maiden Voyage and uh, you haven't read this one, this is really funny. And Ackley is a very accomplished writer too, uh, from the same kind of public school background, but there's great ease in his writing. And um, like I said, the Maharaja, a character never to be forgotten. <laughs> okay, so that's Maiden Voyage <coughs> and a reading suggestion. <clears throat> Welsh's next effort was um, In Youth is Pleasure, with the kind of another painting by Welsh this time. And it's like a kind of Henry Tuke, you know, when they show these in these art galleries in England now, there's always some kind of hoo-ha about the sight of a, of a, like, a adolescent boy's buttocks setting off alarm bells ringing and, and people demanding that they be removed, uh, like that. Like that. But, um, I find these kinds of pictures of the bathing is completely inoffensive, isn't it? I don't, I don't know why in the in the 30s people could have no issue with this, and then today uh, people are uh, getting quite so upset. When I was a child, it was only Mary Whitehouse who was getting upset about this stuff. Now it seems as a uh, as a chorus. Um, <clears throat> so this one is um, if Maiden Voyage is is along like summer vacation. This is another vacation. You know, Welsh is uh, one of the dreamlike magical um, things about Welsh is that he writes about when the ordinary conditions of life, like the work work day world or, or school days, are suspended. So they take place in this kind of um, idyllic atmosphere, you know, where there's, there's no, not, really, not really any pressure upon um, the person to be doing anything other than kind of exploring. You know, so it's, it's very able to uh, kind of harness his curiosity here and so this is on a family holiday in England on a kind of um, country estate which had a famous grotto I think it's called Oatlands which was later uh, knocked down but some of the key incidents take place in this grotto um, what you're seeing here is you begin to see more of Welsh's kind of interests um, at work here um, he's got um, his passion for architecture um, for visiting churches for picnics for recording the details of, of what he eats for writing about interiors for looking at antiques which is a, another passion of his um, he does remind me Welsh in some respects of James Harry's remember the uh, curly haired bow tied little uh, toff <laughs> shall we call him who uh, uh, used to appear on uh, TV very frequently in the uh, in the 80s and he would be opining upon aesthetic matters uh, particularly antiques and art and uh, he also became some kind of uh, cross-dressing uh, trans uh, person later uh, he was real, really ahead of his time because he, he did that many decades ago Welsh is a little like Harry's I think I think they would they would hit it off um, this one starts with him at school again, um, and uh, I'll give you I'll give you a taste here of the of the kind of carry on thing. You can imagine Hattie Jakes being the nurse in a, in this section uh, of a mix of innocence and kind of knowingness here. So let, let's just read this to you. Uh, he's in the um, he's in the infirmary or the, the hospital wing of the of the school with uh, recovering from food poisoning. And he's about to receive a bed bath from a nurse. 
You'll be better after this, she said. You'll feel cooler. When she dried the top half of his body, she popped on his jacket and pulled down his trousers almost in one movement. Then she flung a towel expertly across him and began to wash under it between his legs. Orva was hot and sticky there, and the cool spongings made him tremble. But he did not mind her quick hands darting about under the towel. He felt safe with his jacket on. I wonder if Florence Nightingale taught this way of doing things. How pe isn't it peculiar, he thought. Stop shaking, do, said the nurse, smacking his thighs playfully. For by now his knees were pressing together and then parting, and his whole body was giving little convulsive movements forward. Orville tried to control the twitchings of his body, and then his teeth began to chatter. They clicked together like loose false teeth, and once he bit his tongue and gave a grunt of pain. What are you now, a little porker, suggested the nurse unsympathetically. She did not know what had happened. She finished drying his legs, tied the plaited cord a little too tightly round his waist, and tucked the bedclothes round him again. Now you'll feel fine, she said. Well, I found that, I found that most amusing. I hope you did too. Uh, that's kind of... Uh, gives, you, gives you a taste of the, of the you know, sexual shenanigans here. But there's another little uh, passage in here about a shoe that I will, I will share with you. And um, I think this one speaks to just Welsh's powers of observation, which are s superb, you know, uh, but also the simple style of his writings. So you have this superb observation and very unpretentious um, writing. So here he's going to clean some shoes of this kind of pervy scoutmaster that he's, that he's met. So who suggested that he uh, polish his shoes? Kind of, again, there's, there's some kind of uh, sexual power play going on in this sequence, which ends in a, with a sort of botched s and <laughs> encounter. Okay, but the, let's focus on the shoes, Jason. In a dazed way, Orville fetched the shoes and started to polish them. As he thrust his hand into one of them, he thought, it's always mysterious inside shoes, like a dark cave. No light ever reaches the end. You can only feel along the walls blindly. He placed his fingers in the little hollows, like a string of graded pearls made by the toes. He traced the curve where the ball of the foot fitted. Pressing his knuckles up, he touched the overarching leather, which seemed cracked and yet humid. He thought that there was a whole atmosphere, a little world, inside the shoe. And there is a little world. There is the world of material culture in Welsh's um, writings, not just his novels, but his letters and um, his journals, um, which, which has um, led to some... Uh, critical interest in him lately because of this thing called thing theory and a growing kind of interest in the idea of things um, in particularly in literature being able to uh, in the way they circulate and they're attended to <clears throat> they can be very useful in um, examining um, a culture as much as the as the people there's two books about that there's one by uh, there's one called portable property and there's another very good one which looks at things like the uh, mahogany uh, has become kind of one of the one of the uh, things that is looked at because mahogany's appearance in literary text kind of is a it's circulating on these uh, because of colonial uh, enterprise which is bringing this dark wood into uh, England. All right, so um, the attention to uh, material culture. Welsh also um, took uh, great pains and devoted uh, many many hours to. Um, uh, repairing a, um, a doll's house that he found, an antique doll's house, and uh, that is in the Victoria Albert Museum, if you wish to go and see the uh, the doll's house he painstakingly restored. So that, I think, in, in Youth is Pleasure, is, is real magic, the nostalgia in there, and the magic of childhood, as compared to kind of like uh, an English Proust uh, for his ability to reconstruct uh, the lost world of his um, early life in his in his fiction and um, yeah that, that one is magical right then his final novel a voice through a cloud so he had to get on with this because he knew that um he was going to die 
and it, it also has the, another one of his illustrations of himself. Um, actually, there's a self-portrait by Welsh in the National Portrait Gallery, which is uh, very, very beautiful as well, um, an, an oil painting, but this, this one is the illustration. And this most, his most powerful book, um, I wrote about this one for my, for my thesis, which I'm supposed to be in there finishing off, and it's his account of the accident and um, its aftermath, kind of the, uh, the months following the accident when he's trying to um, be rehabilitated and regain his independence. Now, because of Welsh's um, painter's eye, in, in this one, he enters our... Uh, oh, I've got mine. What makes this one so fascinating is it has some... It's like a phenomenological investigation, shall we say, because the accident plunges him. It has a major effect on his kind of perceptions. And um, he says here, I'd strayed into a nightmare land where I had no part or place. Like Alice, I had burrowed down a rabbit hole to find myself in a world of twisted sight, sound, taste, and touch. And that is what is going on here. He has these very, very strange um, experiences. And his body becomes like a foreign land, which he explores because the pain, there are some of very powerful descriptions of physical pain in here, um, which, which are really arresting because physical pain, as Virginia Woolf noted, is one of the hardest things to render in words. And actually, you know, um, physical pain destroys language. You know, it turns us back towards the, the howl of the, of, the, uh, of the animal, or the cry of the baby. <coughs> Here is, on the, uh, just on the next page, when he's talking about this twisted world, he's riding, an, riding in an ambulance, and it's his first taste of fresh air for months since the accident. And here again, you'll see just the powerful um, ability to observe the world closely and render it in language. So he's describing uh, a wall, yes, and some music that he can hear. And so he says, close to a pink gray wall where every brick seemed to jump out at me separately. I heard music from a wireless or barrel organ. We were traveling slowly and for a moment the music wrapped me round. It must have been loud music, but it came to me as a spidery tinkle filtered through a thousand cobwebs or the sound of some mermaid blowing on her comb in a cave under the sea. It seemed as beautiful and far away as that. Okay. Spidery tinkle through a thousand cobwebs. Yeah. It's a really beautiful book and he wrote it when he was in such agony. Um, he would come around uh, from, from um, he would become conscious and he would quickly write the next section of his book before falling back to a fever. Uh, Eric Oliver, his partner, just noted what a tough son of a bitch he was dealing with his final days because, um, you know, he's, he's been called like, uh, like the godfather or the fairy godmother of sissy literature, but there's a real strength in the way Welsh lived. He was so much his own person and he was very ambitious and he got a lot of work done despite the, uh, the obstacles his illness placed in his path. Okay, so this, this is really more moving than, than the other ones, which are, are more about the magic of childhood. This one is about having your childhood and your, prospect, your prospects destroyed. And it's, it's beautifully observed. The last one is a minor one that I'll touch on, <coughs> which is very short, and it's another kind of picaresque. This time, he walks around England. So that's it. I left my grandfather's house with an another very nice drawing there. Um, I love England, I love walking, and I love walking around England. And um, this, this trip is just so gentle and perfect. And again, he just writes about the cast of characters and the buildings and the things that he sees. And it's a slight work, but it's still, for uh, people that enjoyed the other ones, this is, this is just 
has much of the same kind of quality. And uh, the fact that it's just this wandering, yeah, I'm fine. Let's just wander around England with Denton Welsh. So it's, it's fine by me. There's also another good book about walking around England, which is The Kingdom by the Sea by, uh, um, what's his name, Theroux? Oh, I gotta get mixed up with the Louis Theroux. It's his, it's his dad. Is it Paul Theroux? That one's really good too. Walking around England at, at the time of the Falklands uh, conflict. It, it's marvellous. And travelling by train as much as is possible. So that, that one's really, really good. Now, I just, uh, I've said enough about these. This is another too long video, right? But if you enjoy Welsh's um, novels and you want some more Welsh-like uh, writings, then, then there are these novels by Barbara Pym, who uh, was obsessed with Denton Welsh. And uh, this one is the most Welsh-like because it has like some few homosexual characters knocking around and it's, it's set in the world of the antiques trade. Uh, so this is the most Welsh, like the sweet dove died. It's like a, it's a line from poetry. She's always got a lot of poetry in her books. But the great thing about Barbara Welsh is she's not like uh, Barbara Pym, not Barbara Welsh. That's, that's, that's good coinage. She's got a lot of books, a lot. And they're all set in the same kind of world. And she's also compared to Jane Austen, who Welsh is like a mix between Jane Austen and Proust. But Welsh is more Jane Austen than Proust, really. Barbara Pym, that's what keeps you going for a year, reading those. And they're, they're really excellent. They have that m miniature, you know, dealing in miniatures, like Austen and Welsh, you know, focused on the really, really small details of... of so this is a uh, historic moment, because... Um, the uh, the first part of this uh, video, um, I ran out of storage on my on my phone, and so I've had to learn how to um, edit in order to uh, attach this bit to the other bit. So uh, that's why up to now my my videos have just been one long like this because I'm not really uh, sure how to edit. So if I if you're watching this, then I've worked it worked it out. Okay, so I recommended Barbara Pym, and that that's quite a quite a logical kind of step because uh, she herself admitted her kind of debt to Welsh. Um, less, more of a tangent would be uh, this, if you enjoy, if, you, if you've read the journals of Denton Welsh, you thought they were good. If you're that into his writing, then these, the journals of Marie Oshkurtz. She was uh, born in Ukraine, but at that time Ukraine was a part of Russia, so she's culturally um, Russian. Although I noticed with the conflict in Ukraine that her, her beautiful paintings are being used to kind of push the kind of pro all things all things Ukraine right now, but actually culturally uh, she is Russian, so there's a kind of anachronism in, uh, in claiming her as a, as a Ukrainian. Her paintings are really good. They've also become, uh, they've attracted considerable interest. But just like Welsh, the, um, the connection is they both died young. They both were very intensely ambitious, um, but Kurtz said even more so. The, they both loved gossip, and uh, they both wrote journals. And this caused a sensation at the time it was published. And she's been called the first blogger, uh, Marie Bushkurtz. This is really a window into the life of a, and, the, and the aspirations of an aristocratic teenager girl of the period and it's it's enormous and at the start all the ambition all, it's just so nakedly ambitious it's for me as a as a self-deprecating uh, failure uh it's really off-putting it just seems you know it's just so distant from my from my own kind of um, way of way of living but as it goes on it accumulates a lot of force and to see the world for this girl being extinguished and seeing her being overtaken by by desperate ill health as she um, perishes from tuberculosis it's really heartbreaking and her faith <coughs> her innocent faith in god she says why would god create someone so talented just to snuff out their life so early you know, like a like a candle but she only lived i think even maybe died even earlier than Welsh. But 
there's a funny moment in the journals or in one of the biographies it mentions that Welsh was listening to a radio show on the wireless about the journals of Marie Bushkirtse in the company of um, Eric Oliver, his partner, and um, he he reacted really huffily to to her to her ambition and, and say, oh, she's oh, terrible like that. And Eric Oliver was just thinking, looking at him like sidelong glance, side glance, thinking, oh my goodness, you know, you're like two peas in a pod. No wonder, no wonder you don't like seeing it reflected so nakedly in someone else. So you could uh, could spend six months reading this because it's uh, it's 600 odd pages there. Okay, that will conclude this video. Um, thank you if you made it this far and um, I'll see you again soon. Uh, take care, have a wonderful uh, rest of your life and until the next time, nanu nanu. <laughs>